What year is it again? <laughs> Today, it's time for a Zerk versus Terran, where we find ourselves on King Sejong Station. Now, if you've been watching StarCraft for a while, you may remember this map. It was popular back in 2016. It's been a little while since I've seen a game on it. I think I actually casted it, I don't know, some time ago as well, when for some reason a bunch of pro gamers decided to play a couple of games on these maps. Either way! Today in the top left hand corner of King Sejong Station with the Blue Zerg drones, we have a man who just came back from his mandatory military service and his name is Sue, who definitely played on King Sejong Station back in the day, and so did his opponent, playing out the Red Terra SCVs, likewise also from Korea, we're looking at Byun's main command center. So Byun versus, oh my god, there's a barracks coming up. Um, Beyond versus Sue on King Sejong Station. I mean, I could have literally casted this game like six years ago and nobody would have realized that it was a modern game, okay? Like, I mean, if I could have gone to the future in the past and, you know, in the present, I would have then casted it and uploaded it on the, the YouTube channel so you guys could see the past upload that I did in the present moment, but it's actually from a future game, right? Anyways, what I'm trying to get at is that I think we should be in for a really cool game. Um, what I've noticed is that recently in quite a few of the, yeah, the pro gamer chats and whatnot, people are starting to get a little bit tired of the maps, okay? It's not that the maps in the current map pool of StarCraft 2 are bad, they're actually really, really good. It's just that we've been playing on them for a little while. So Blackburn and 2000 Atmospheres, I just looked it up, they were introduced back on the 6th of April 2021. So we've literally been playing those maps for longer than a year. It's by the way, Barracks into Command Center. A little bit greedy right here for Mr. Bjorn, not gonna lie. Hatch gas pool here from Sue, so I think there's gonna be some Reaper shenanigans, but because, yeah, there is a little jump up pad right over there in the back of the main. Anyways, um, Pride of Terrace, Hardwire, Glittering Ashes, Curious Minds, and Berlingrad. We've been playing those since the 19th of October. So, hey, Blizzard. I, I know there's not a lot of people working on StarCraft, but like, maybe someone can hear me, you know, like, there's new maps. We had two TOMCs, right? We had, we have good, please. That'd be nice, thank you. One day, when the one intern in charge of stock, no, actually, there's not even one intern. Let's be real. <laughs> it sucks, but yeah, there really isn't. Because if there's an intern, it implies that there's also, you know, someone actually overseeing the, there's no one, man. I'm pretty sure, there's actually a lot of damage being done here by this one Reaper. Second Reaper showing up right now too. I'm pretty sure the way that it goes, and this is just a theory, right? I have no clue. But I'm pretty sure there's like a, a team in charge of classic games that handle like, you know, Diablo 2 and, and StarCraft 2 and the original StarCraft and Warcraft 3 and Heroes of the Star, right? There's probably like one little team that works on that and they just occasionally get around to doing something StarCraft related. Like they actually recently, credit where credit's due, I suppose. I mean, I guess our expectations are so low at this point that, you know, um, we don't really, we don't really care that much, but there, there was recently a patch, like, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, I don't know, time is funny, um, where they finally ended up fixing the API as well as the latter Master League bug. So in case you're unfamiliar, a lot of people just got randomly promoted into Master League for like a year now, and even though it didn't necessarily matter very much as far as like, you know, your MMR goes, it, it was just like a graphical bug, they finally fixed that. So, it's a bit awkward, because every day I would have people reaching out to me saying, Hey Loco, I finally got promoted to Master League, even though I haven't played in three years, lol. And, uh, yeah, I don't have the heart to tell them that it's a bug. <laughs> but hey, at the very least, that's fixed, right? And the API is also working again, so maybe they'll get around to adding new maps again at some point. Anyhow, uh, this particular match is from a recent Alpha X tournament. I believe it's from, like, a best of 11 or something like that. Nice little bit of counter-attack damage, by the way. Four SCVs for three drones. Not bad. Um, I would cast the entire best of 11, but like there's only so many hours I can talk to myself in a room every day So I figured I'm just gonna I think I'm gonna cast this one And then also I saw that there was a game in the replay pack on frost So yeah, we'll have a look at that one too after this one should be interesting Anyways aggressive openers here from the both of them Sue didn't really sign up for it But mr. Bjorn decided to proxy that very first barracks and both players uh, yeah, ended up losing a couple of workers there. Not the end of the world whatsoever, though, because I think they're both in a pretty comfortable position to indeed transition away from this. So, King Sejong Station, it's always kind of... Like, I've always kind of felt like this was like a, a Command & Conquer map or something. Like, it doesn't really feel like a StarCraft map to me, because there's these, like, strange little alleyways where you can, like, you know, like, for example, proxy a barracks. There's another one right over here. 
I've seen games where, like, the Protoss player ends up putting a pylon over there and then a dark shrine right over there, right? You can kind of... It feels a little bit funky. There's also these, like, paths all the way on the outskirts of the map where you can indeed run units. So it feels a little bit different than most of the StarCraft maps, and I think that's one of the main reasons why uh, it's been a very popular one overall. There's these rocks in the back of the Natural Expo. Obviously, the map is mirrored. Uh, but there's rocks in the, the back of the Natural Expo, and once those open up, you have access to another expansion that's a little bit easier to acquire, but obviously it also exposes you a little bit better. Usually not a, a base we saw very often, but definitely something we can expect if the game goes the distance. Anyhow, Sue going for the old school build. I mean, I've casted a couple of Sue games ever since he came back about a month and a half or so ago, and the, uh, he seems to be very fond of playing Mutaling Bane. It's kind of cool, man. I gotta say, I actually really like the way that Sue plays, even though it's like the exact opposite of what I personally do. He makes some crazy decisions. It seems like he's gambling with a lot of his units, where he just crosses his fingers and hopes he, he doesn't fly into a bunch of, you know, Widow Mines or Marines or anything along those lines, but he seems to be pretty successful, considering he only just recently came back. He's once again already uh, looking very strong. Bjorn, of course, very good at the game, though. The only uh, problem that Bjorn runs into every once in a while is that he's got wrist issues. So it kind of depends, right? When this game was played in like the best of 11, I suppose. But sadly, uh, yeah, he's never been able to properly control that. Apparently, occasionally, he literally has to stop playing in the middle of a series and he doesn't finish it because his wrists hurt so bad, which really sucks. I hope that one day he can find a good solution, but honestly, unlikely. Since the naturals, though, are facing each other, right? So, on most of the maps in StarCraft 2, you expand away from one another. On King Sejong, though, like, the main bases are actually very, very far apart, but the naturals are actually relatively close, especially in air-to-air -air distance. I mean, the map overall, though, is very big. Much bigger than we see the average map being right now in the current meta of StarCraft 2. Interestingly enough, when StarCraft 2 first came out, back in Wings of Liberty, the maps were tiny. Because of that, they were pretty bad for Zerk overall, and Zerk, you know, seemed a little bit shaky. Then the map slowly got bigger and bigger and bigger over time. And now, over the last couple of years, I think since the release of, like, I don't know, like, patch 5.0? Maybe 4.0 already, I'm not entirely sure. But, like, the maps have been getting progressively smaller again. So, if you calculate the playable area, apparently it's been going down. Which is kind of cool. King Sejong, though, seems like a massive map to me, is what I'm trying to get at. It's also to do, I guess, that we're doing a lot of two-player maps. Back in the day, we used to have four-player maps quite a bit more often as well on the ladder. And with that in tournaments, too. Second factory coming up here for Bjorn. He'll know at this point that it's going to be Muta play. So I'm expecting there's going to be some, uh, yeah, some Widow Mine shenanigans. Probably bumping out three of those bad boys at once. Trying to keep that, uh, that Zerg player occupied. Obviously, uh, it takes a couple of those Widow Mine hits to kill the Mutalisks. Usually not really what you're hoping for, but you're just using them as like a zoning tool, so the Zerg doesn't get very aggressive. One thing I've noticed actually with the way that Sue controls his Mutas over, for example, like a Serral or a Raynor or a Dark or a Rogue is that he's pretty passive with them. Like, I feel like I feel like all of the other top-level Zergs, they're, they're diving aggressively into their mineral lines. And Sue will do so when he finds an opportunity, but he seems to be more than keen to just kind of flippy-flap these bad boys around to creep. Which really doesn't seem very optimal, but once again, he's he's looking very strong, so... Yeah, not entirely sure if he's just finding his way, or like, you see the way he's maneuvering these units around right now? It almost seems like he's a bit bored, and he's like, okay, I have nothing else to do, so I guess I fly them around. Maybe he's just continuously moving to try and like, you know, keep the, the Terran opponent guessing, but it seems... a little indecisive. Right? If you look the way at, like, for example, the way that, that Serral plays, it's all very surgical. Serral wouldn't be flipping, flapping these guys back and forth. He would be patrolling if that's the way he wants to do it. Anyways, Marines on the left side of the map. Terran army in the middle of the map. Bjorn apparently brave enough to send Marines, well, to their deaths, let me be real. This, this is a one-way trip. Uh, but he's going to be sending them out despite the fact that there are Mutalisks out on the map. Muta's right now, though. Finally, apparently, in big enough numbers to go after the missile turrets as well. A couple of drones end up going down here so far. Terran army trying to be annoying, but honestly, so far, these are all relatively local middle type of pushes, right? Beyond just trying to clear a little bit of creep here in the middle of the map. Trying to be annoying, but he's waiting for 2-2. He's waiting for the plus one. He's waiting right here for the drilling claws upgrade as well. 
all of those things will make dealing with Mjolnir Bane way easier. Sue right now, though, like this is, I guess, what confuses me a little bit as, uh, about Sue's playstyle. Normally, you see players going for timing attacks, where they try to like certain, like they hit certain attack timings right when upgrades finish. So usually with two two or you know three three. But look, he's going plus two, plus two, plus two. Right, he's going for a little bit of everything, and then he's like, yep. That's it, and then it finishes, and he's like, all right, I guess I'll go 3-3. Like, it's it's a different way of playing Zerk. Normally, all of the attacks are either based around upgrades, or you go for, like, 100 drones, right? Like, that's a style we see quite a bit as well. But Sue is playing, like, what seems to be in the middle of the road, which historically has never been particularly strong. But, yeah, he seems to be making it work. So it's kind of interesting. Bjorn obviously knows this as well, though. So I do feel like it's something he can't punish if he does it well. Rather than like Sue, okay, let me try to put it like this. Rather than Sue trying to create an opportunity by attacking the opponent to go for that tempo lead, he's waiting for the opponent to overstep. And then as soon as they go too deep on creep, he crushes an army, then he goes for the full-on counterattack. It's a it's a it's a bit of a different approach, but it is definitely very cool. Anyways, he's got the hive coming up right now. Terran's gone straight into 3-3. He's now securing that middle section of the map. So this is actually a really quite a, an important section. If you knock down these rocks, by the way, they do fall over, which I think is probably a good choice. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, <laughs> don't crush your own hell, bet. Luckily, it was on ice skates. Ooh. Mr. Sue decided to go for a base that is normally one of the Terrans. Now, Beyond does have a sensor tower right over here that just finished up after, I think, that the, the hatchery started. So he does see that there's a little blip right there on the radar. It should probably be an indicator. I mean, honestly, if you see this, you probably expect it to be a Zerkling, right? Like something blocking your expo if you fly a command center over there. You don't really expect it to be an entire hatchery. So maybe he's actually not going to go check this. If he would have known, I think he would have gone and checked. Anyways, both players maxed out. These are some very expensive trades here, though, for Sue. Like, sure, he cleans up some of those, uh, some of those Widow Mines, but at the cost of, like, a dozen Banelings. Okay, Bjorn slowly, methodically, taking control of the map. Thors do get picked off. Ooh, nice micro right there by Bjorn! Okay, sadly that one over there does end up going down because of the medevac. Uh, if the medevac falls while it's holding a Thor, the Thor will actually die. I know. So what does he see now? Okay, now he sees a couple- Yeah, dude, this, this little wiggling over here. If he's paying very close attention, I think he should realize that that is indeed a hatchery. I was thinking if there's drones over here, he doesn't actually have a range of the center tower, and obviously they haven't played this map in a while. Okay. Taren finishing up 3-3. Okay. He did send a medevac over here to check. I think the additional blips right there showed him that something was off. I think clearing out the rocks in the back of the natural is probably the better choice here, Sue. Love the way that Bjorn is playing this, though. Slowly, methodically moving forward. There's a couple of choke points that Terran has to concern themselves with. This is one of them, and obviously the one in the middle here too. And then I guess the back. But this is definitely a map where you can turtle up quite nicely. That's exactly what Sue is trying to avoid right now from happening too. But you see how like Sue's playstyle seems a little bit... Directionless? Like, it seems like he doesn't really have much of a plan here other than trying to wait for his opponent to overextend. I'm not saying it's bad, it just seems less efficient, right? Like, it's just a different way of playing. We don't really see the other top level Zerg players play like this. It's a lot more passive. Anyways, he did decide to now go for the hatchery right here on the left side too. I feel like, like, the reason why it makes me a little hesitant is because I feel like it's benefiting the Terran in the end. If Terran doesn't make a critical error, which obviously is hard. Uh, this is an interesting fight. I do feel like it's probably gonna be, it's probably gonna be an advantage in the end for Terran. Yeah, Bjorn is doing this really well, though. Not overextending. Waiting until the creeper recedes before he actually moves forward. Slowly taking care of some of those hatches. I think that this base is also very droppable. Although, yeah, there's a, a Zerkling right here on the watchtower. Protecting that, uh, that area of the map quite well. So, as soon as he realizes that there might be a potential for a drop, those Mutas come flying on over. It's gonna be an Ultra Transition. Another 
Ah. You know, that's, that's how I feel about Ultras. It's like, mm, yeah, no. Yes, and. Oh, ooh, I love that, actually. Knocking down the rocks, crushing Brenda. That's kind of sad. Brenda over there did nothing wrong, okay? She just shot a couple spines at a medivac. No need to crush her like that with rocks. Anyways, it's now giving the Thor a bit of a better spot over here to deal some damage. Two Marines once again steaming backwards. Trying to dodge as many of those Banes as possible, but Bjorn is doing Bjorn things. Kind of sticking around on just the good old Marine Marauder Medivac. Now, okay. I like this move, okay? This is something that Mr. Bjorn doesn't always aim for, but he's going for ghosts. There's days during which Bjorn wakes up in the morning and he's like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm not gonna make anything but Marines and Medivacs. And then there's days where he goes ghosts and Liberators and all that too. Okay. Is the planetary gonna fall in the middle of the map? I think it might just, yeah. Barely enough damage coming out of Sue right there, rolling forward with the entirety of the Zerg force. Bjorn Dodo? Bjorn Dodo. <laughs> Bjorn does clean it up. That was a very expensive set of units right there for Zerg to lose. That being said, his eco is still looking mighty fine. 80 workers over 60. Hatchery once again being reacquired. I think his plan is probably just to like outmine the opponent. If he has an entire extra base. <laughs> okay. Well, mutas aren't going to do any damage here. I can tell you that much. You're going to need a lot more mutas than that. No way. I mean, two ultras are going to have a blast over here, though, if they get into that spot. I'd love to see a planetary in the choke or like right over there. That'd be cool. Anyways, I think his plan is probably to like mine an entire extra base from the opponent. So if he can mine this entire base out, that would be absolutely huge. Or of course, just take a dominating fight and then go in for the counterattack. He's doing a great job though, spreading the creep around. Okay. Now this seems, this seems a little dangerous. I would love to see a missile tower, or sorry, a sensor tower right around over there, or like at least in a location where I can see these sort of movements coming in. Because he can't, right? Like at this point, Bion is kind of in the darkness. Yeah. Okay, so a sensor tower, I think, I was thinking about a more conservative spot, but like, yeah, seems like a good idea. Well, it's not gonna happen. Suddenly there was a dinosaur. Good snipes here, though. Oh, those snipes are really nice. Planetary once more falls. Ooh, somehow that ultra escaped. No, it didn't. <laughs> All right, once again, great movement right there by Bjorn. Bjorn's actually such a good player. He's very consistent too. Like he always showcases good games, at least the games that I see. Maybe not as consistent as like a Cure or for example, a Maru, because you know they're always gonna do well, right? Whereas with Bjorn, you never know about his wrists. Which kind of sucks, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, yeah, you always know at the very least that Bjorn, when he is feeling it, he is certainly going to be very, very good. This is a sick game. Yeah, watching, watching, well, I was going to say new maps, but I guess different maps. Um, it's, it's good, right? Like, it's exciting. It changes the entire dynamic. Like, at some point, we've seen the games on Hardwire. We know how in Terran vs. the Zerg and Terran can, like, be aggressive. And we've seen on, like, Berlin Grad how the Zerg can do very aggressive Roach pushes. We've seen all of that. It's nice to see a little bit of variety once again. And especially if the maps are already there. I hope... I... I yeah. Word on the street has it that we're going to be seeing new maps again very soon. But anyways, here we go. Zerg hunting down the ghosts. He's hunting with those Banelings right here for the ghosts. Good splits here by the Terran player, keeping most of those units alive. Excellent work there by Bjorn. That being said, that was a pretty expensive exchange. This time around, though, the command center lives, and with that, the majority of the workers, too. This hatchery over here has been denied several times. One problem here, though, that Bjorn is going to run into over the next couple of minutes is that his money is running out. So, the natural, the third, the main, all of those are already basically out. And then, he's only really got the center base, as well as the one right over here on the left. And that's what I'm trying to... Like, I think that's probably what Sue is trying to do. He's just... Maybe not even necessarily needing to mine from that expo, he just needs to deny his opponent. So, he's going Mutaling Bane, Ultra Infester. I like the addition of Infestors right here. 
Would have liked to see them a little bit sooner, if I'm being honest with you. Okay, good snipe once again. Dude, snipe is so good. Ghosts are so nice. Okay, the only thing they're not good against is Ling Bane. Gotta be so careful with those Widow Mines, though. Sometimes the Widow Mines just absolutely destroy that Terran army instead. Yeah, Bion's running out of money. Same can be said for Sue. Doesn't have a lot anymore, but he's got this entire base over on the left side of the map. We're actually coming down to the last minerals. There's only this expo, yeah. So, mm, I don't know. I, I don't think Sue's ever going to be able to properly mine that one, but he's going to try. I think he needs to max out first. Um, so those infestors are going to be quite important. A couple of ghosts here, though. Very exposed. Can you please pick them up? Okay, no, not necessary. Once again, baiting the ultras back towards the ramp. Couple of ghosts waiting on the high ground, sniping whatever they can. I like the idea of the missile turrets here too, because one thing we've seen a lot recently is infestors with neural parasite. Well, a lot. We've seen it. Uh, where they use the neural parasite on the ghosts and then they EMP the other ghosts. Missile turrets are detectors, meaning that. Mineral? Yeah. Burr out infestors like that shouldn't be spotted. Long distance mining over here. Bjorn sending a medevac over in that direction. Fungal growth though here at the front. That ultra running dangerously low on health and it will die before getting in any damage. Good splits here once again by Bjorn. Okay, Bjorn getting rid of the base over here. This is actually such a sick game. I have no idea who's winning. I think Bjorn is winning. Just because his army is just like preferable. But it could be over with one good fungal growth. One bad widow mine hit. Okay, Mutas getting sniped out of the sky right now too. Those infestors have been EMP'd it seems. Okay. He's trying to make a choke hold right here on the base on the left. Hatchery on the right, also in a lot of trouble this time around, though. The natural is wide open right there for Sue, so he's running units down from the low ground. Oh my god, Fungal! 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 No Fungal! He didn't have energy! Oh, dude, he just barely doesn't have enough energy on those infestors. If he would have gotten a Fungal there, that would have actually... That may have been the deciding moment, actually. If he would have gotten that Fungal off, if that EMP didn't happen earlier from Bjorn. I mean, I missed it on the screen. I think it was an EMP. Maybe he just ran out of energy. Anyways, he's still counterattacking. Man, imagine if that would have been one fungal. There's an EMP once more. Two snipes going down as well. Sue does kill a whole lot of SCVs, but honestly, Bjorn already had too many workers to begin with. The expo right here on the right side once again denied. This did buy a little bit of time for Sue to continue mining over there. Doesn't have a lot of money anymore in these expos, so do you really want to make a hatchery? Sue so hasn't had time to relay the creep tumors over here either, so now he's moving forward. Dude, I would love to see a nuke. Imagine a nuke right now. That'd be awesome. Anyways. GG. Nicely done right there by Bjorn. Or, as a lot of you in the comments section like to say, that was Bjorn believable. Hey, there it is. Okay, next up, we're on Frost. Bottom right in corner, we have Sue. His opponent, in the bottom left, he goes by the name of Bjorn. Alrighty, so Frost historically is one of the absolute most popular maps ever. Um, let me look it up real quick. Frost Liquipedia. What? There's a Valorant guy called Frost? There's a Heroes of New Earth and Dota player called Frost? No, I'm looking for the map. Frost Esports. Okay, maybe I should have prepared this. Anyways, Frost LE. It's made by a guy called Semo back in 2016. Or at the very least, that's when we started playing it on the ladder. So this is a four-player map, meaning that there could be, yeah, spawn locations in every corner. And at the beginning of the game, you never know where your opponent spawns. Meaning that, well, Sue is sending his overlord right now all the way up north. Not gonna find anything. Second OV though, moving on over towards the left side of the map instead. Semo made two maps. Interesting. So Semo apparently has historically made two notable maps. One called Frost. And then one called Bridgehead. Interesting. So he won the Map of the Year award. But he's only really made Frost. Yeah, so Bridgehead has... Uh, okay, so Bridgehead has had 369 professional games played on it. At the very least, tournament games. And Frost has had 4,189. <laughs> what was cool about Frost is that despite the fact that it was a four-player map, is that it was very, very balanced. So historically, again, 
Uh, Four-player maps are hard to balance just because there may be spawn imbalances, right? You imagine if your opponent can just hit your third base from their natural, that would not be great. Um, Frost for Terran versus Zerg has got a win rate for Zerg of 50.5%. That is over a sample group of about a thousand games. Zerk versus Protoss, Zerk has a win rate of 49%. And Terran versus Protoss, Protoss has a win rate of 51%. So honestly, very impressive stuff. Yeah, that's that's honestly very impressive. Like I didn't realize I didn't realize it was that close. Very cool. He also made another map apparently that was not played competitively called Fruitland. Which I did play a game on once upon a time. Yeah, I remember that map. I think it was played in the one of the GSL tournaments. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyways. Um, standard openers here from the both of them. You kind of have to when you're playing a... Well, we do have a pretty quick factory here. Anyways. Um, you you kind of have to when you play a four-player map because you never really know what your opponent is going for. Like, you can't reliably scout your opponent very early unless you send out multiple workers, but that's obviously a little shaky. So you got to... Yeah, at this point, Bjorn, he, he saw the direction at which the Zerklings ran from, so he should know where his opponent spawned, but you never really know exactly what you're going up against, right? It, it could be a variety of all-ins, so therefore it makes sense to either, I guess, play super aggressively, right? So trying to sneak a couple of Zerklings around the site, or to play like a build that's kind of good against everything. And uh, it seems like Bjorn has opted for that second option. The Zerklings also getting a full scout in the main base. Which I like. Meaning that Sue at this point knows exactly what he's going up against. Now, these maps are gonna feel a little dated though. Like, this third base location, it feels very, I don't know, very exposed. I would actually like to see like, I don't know, the layouts from old maps being used with maybe some changes. Like imagine if we, we had a change to where the third base was located, right? Maybe it would be a little bit safer right over... Nah, that also feels far away. It'd be cool though if this layout of the map was given to current map makers. For them to make like a, a modern version of it. Ooh, lovely play right there by Bjorn sniping that creep tumor. Bjorn believable indeed. Nah, he, he does do those moves really nicely. Zerklings once again though, sneaking around. There's a lot of alleyways for them to run through. So once more, they get into the natural. Okay, that Hellion a little bit overly ambitious. There is a Banshee coming up. Again, very nice to have. Not just for the offense, but especially for the defense. If this would have been a... What's it called? Like a, a Roach opener or like a Roach push. At the very least, Beyond would have been able to stop that without like, you know, being in a lot of trouble. Unless he loses the units for free. Ah, nice micro. I mean, nice micro after he took a lot of damage. Anyhow, Sue once again opting for a quick lair. Going for a bailing nest. And I've got a feeling he's coming up in 200 gas right as the lair finishes. Spire? I feel like this man is aspiring to make a spire. Hello. What did he just spend his gas on? Two overseers? All right. Is he not gonna go Spire? I feel like he's going Spire a lot. DRG was actually doing the same thing when he first came back from the military. This is uh, quite a while ago. But DRG was making, he was making Muras. Oh, nicely done, man. Beyond's, Beyond's micro is actually really close, it's nice. Anyways, uh, when he first came back from the military, he was going Muras every single matchup. If we're not, okay, yeah, I, I was gonna say, if we're not going bailing speed, what are we gonna do? Bailing speed is a more, conventional, more modern option. The nice thing about Bailing Speed is that you can hold most of the marine-based pushes, aka most of the Terran pushes. Speaking of marine pushes, plus one infantry weapons, actually kind of late. Bjorn's gonna go into the Stimpak research here. He's gonna go Combat Shield as a follow-up, I'm sure. Bit of a different way to getting there. So this is a, again, an old-school build right here from Terran 2. Where he's opting to go triple racks before 3rd CC. He could even support up to 5 barracks here if he wants to. Yeah, so Sue is actually going to sit around on just Ling Bane Queen for the time being. Which I think is a much better choice. He hasn't seen his opponent taking a 3rd. Now the Overseer is going in. This is nice. This is a good scout. So you will notice here that there's a lot of barracks production and no 3rd base. Which is a good indication that Terran is likely going to be aggressive here. 
So you should basically just defend. Okay. Siege tank on the watchtower. Second siege tank just popped out of a plane. How does it work? It's bigger than the plane. Nobody knows. Maybe Terrans do have access to warp fields after all. Okay, good scan. So, Bjarne's starting up a very slow push. Even though combat shield and plus one aren't very quick. He's planning on pushing, I think, when those upgrades are done, but he's just shown up like a minute before the upgrades actually were, which is kind of nice. Benshee's going in for a very deep cloak. Because of that, they haven't popped on the minimap. Yeah, now they show themselves. I actually like that too. Normally, we don't see players cloaking the, the Benshee's this early, but... So usually kind of a newbie move, right? But now he actually got a, a little bit of damage done because of it. Zerklings once again going around the side. This time around though, Bjorn is close to front door. Third command center is just about to finish up. Okay. Not a lot of wiggle room over here on the right side of the map. Yeah, so one of the benches will go down. We've actually got more dead space on maps right now. Like you can't actually move all the way out here. In modern maps, we have a little bit more uh, more wiggle room around the outskirts, most of the time, anyways. Eh, maybe it's not necessarily a modern thing. Anyhow, um, well, where's Zerk gonna take the fourth base? Okay, yeah, I was gonna say, so this is... Hmm, Terran's gonna... Okay, so they've just become next-door neighbors, which will suit Bjorn just fine. I thought he was gonna go for a push, by the way, but he's kind of camping on the watchtower. Scan? Ooh, nice. Yeah, this will suit Bjorn just fine. If he can... ...be at the Zerg's front door... ...just by, you know, walking a little bit, he's gonna be a very happy player. It's gonna make all this aggression a little bit easier. There's finally the Spire coming up. So Sue's still opting to go for a Spire. The man loves Spires. What do you need to defend as a Zerk? Queens. What else do you need? More Queens. <laughs> oh, well, you know what? Maybe uh, Bjorn did overstay his welcome right there at the Watchtower. Does get pushed back a little bit, but I, this is an awkward spot, right? So, yeah, Sue is remaking the spawning pool right now. He's going for a Spire. I, mm, I actually was quite impressed with the way that King Sejong played. I don't think I like what Mr. Sue is doing here very much. Like, again, it's just a little too passive for my liking. You can, yeah, you can go for this base up there, and then you can continue playing that style, I guess? But you need a lot of creep. This base over here is just, like, it's... This this expo over here is not set up for passivity, right? Like, this is a an active play type of base, just because it's so far forward. And Mr. Bjorn is playing very aggressively and very actively, which is much different. Anyways, I'd like to believe, but it's just... Mm, mm. It is very cool, though, to see that there are multiple playstyles that are viable, right? Don't get me wrong. Watching people play Lurkers literally every single game was also not my favorite meta. Alright, so how are we gonna stop this? This is what I was trying to explain earlier. We could go for a full-on counter-attack, which at this point beyond scouts because there's that Benchy from earlier just chilling over at the watchtower. Alright, some of the marines indeed are gonna be stepping back. There's still siege tanks. Okay, there's no siege tank over there. I was thinking maybe a couple inside of the main base. They can also defend the third, as well as the mat. Oh my god, this choke point over here. Dude, these siege tanks are gonna have a blast, literally. Uh -huh. Dude, I do not like that choke there for Sue whatsoever, but I love it for Bjorn. The one tank in the front already got picked off, but the others have 14 and 12 kills. They're probably not done yet either, though. Queen's gonna continuously transfuse each other, but eventually they will run out of money or out of energy. Uh, fourth base? Not gonna happen. He did remake that hatchery up north. 
Don't die. Okay, that was a good bailing hit. Siege tank over here, killing a couple of marines too. No big deal, apparently. But yeah. A little bit too much damage is being done by Bjorn, who played an amazing two games. Very active and very aggressive, and it allows him for a well-deserved victory. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, I upload new videos pretty much every single day, so don't forget to subscribe.